issues that were there. But I think it would be fair to say that South Africa had the benefit of also having learned a bit from the experiences of other African countries. And I think part of what uh, gave the courage uh, also to the political dimension of the leadership was, I think, a commitment that we should not go down the same trodden path that would have led to, to, to in certain instances, to disastrous consequences of the continent. And, and, and I think uh, this, this issue of learning, learning from others, learning from previous experiences, and then seeing how that to apply it in your own context, I think becomes a very key element of what needs to be done. What role did you see for the international community in South Africa's transition? I think the international community played a very key role. Uh, first of all, I think the international community first had, uh, had sent a very strong signal that uh, change was necessary and that the international community was ready to support the package of change. That's the first thing. The second thing is that quite clearly the international community was sending signals also uh, which, uh, which were related to rewarding positive changes. And, 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 and therefore, in that sense, the, the pressure and as well as the hope of, of getting support for the difficult, difficult road ahead, uh, which, which were clearly coming out of the international community, assisted the process. So lots of external pressure, in a sense, pushing the parties to the negotiating table, making sure they, they didn't get up and leave, and, and some carrots to make sure that they were rewarded for staying there. We've had some success in applying the same sort of method to countries outside of South Africa, Congo, Burundi, for example, even recently with former President Mbeki's efforts in Sudan. But we've, in the eyes of many people, had limited success in, in Zimbabwe. Why do you think it's been so difficult to bring about stability and peace in Zimbabwe? Well, I mean, I think uh, like uh, uh, in so many other things, uh, change would have to be internally driven. Now, the external forces and uh, the international community can help to an extent. They put the pressure, they give the right set of incentives, as you've correctly pointed out. But more fundamentally, the internal players must reach a point where they're ready to make the decisive moves because in any event, a durable solution will depend on the actions of the internal players. I think in the case of Congo, DRC, of the DRC, of Burundi, we probably, with some difficulty, and of course it's not a smooth process, people don't voluntarily necessarily get to that stage, but, but I think there is a point at which people increasingly were inclined, and, and the citizenry in those countries quite clearly were sending very strong signals of, of a lack of readiness to, 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 to continue in the old way. I think the difficulty in Zimbabwe is that, uh, quite frankly, I don't believe that the level of, of, of mutual respect, the level of, of mutual trust uh, amongst the key players uh, uh, is there. So even in the context of gradually moving into the inclusive government, which was a significant achievement, but all of us while observing what's going on in Zimbabwe obviously continue to be concerned that, uh, that as we move forward, uh, players seem to be again moving back to their previous positions. Uh, and, and I think this lack of trust, this lack of uh, coming to a common acceptance of a shared destiny and that uh, the space for everybody to play in the field in the interest of the country, and I think that's, that's the key challenge. Zimbabwe, for some reason, I think uh, is struggling, for the leadership of Zimbabwe, is struggling to get to that position. Now... Obviously, trust is important, local leadership is important, local ownership is important, but the external community, whether it be in Africa or further afield, uh, can also come to the party. When you look at, say, peacekeeping missions or peace-building missions in a place like Afghanistan with many thousands of troops, 55,000 in the south alone, and you look at the size of, of a mission in Somalia, just 8,500 troops with far fewer resources, what message do you have for the international community about assisting Africa? First of all, I think uh, we need to really appreciate the fact that some of what appears as, as minor regional sports in Africa really have the possibility to blow up into something of major concern to the international community. I think it's, it's fair to say that the international community 
people tend to move once they feel their own interests are threatened. Uh, and, and I think the key message to the international community is that don't, don't ever think that the problems that face Africa today are going to remain permanently localized in the African continent. I think, the, as, as, as was clear in the discussion, uh, as is evident also from the, the, the sort of conspicuous presence of, of Al-Qaeda-affiliated Al entities in the form of Al-Shabaab in Somalia, for example, now, that quite clear, Al-Qaeda has decided to open a second front, another important front, not the only front, in Somalia. And, and all that will happen is simply that as they get displaced from one area to the other, they will look for another spot to reorganize. And I think, therefore, there needs to be stronger partnership between the rest of the international community and the African continent. Of course, the African continent has to also send strong signals about readiness to commit and to make the necessary sacrifices. But quite clearly, the international community also needs to recognize that even with willingness, with political will, there's an issue of resources that is necessary to back up uh, that commitment and the efforts of the African Union. Lieutenant General Edward Wamala is the commander of land forces in the Uganda People's Defense Force. He is in charge of peacekeeping forces in Somalia. He says trying to bring peace to conflict-ravaged Somalia has been exceptionally difficult. Welcome, General Wamala, to the Tswali Dialogue on the Future of Stability Operations. So you've had extensive experience in stability operations, most notably recently as commander of the Ugandan Land Forces in Somalia. Do you think that Somalia can ever be stabilized from your experience? Thanks. Yeah, I really, we, we really believe, uh, as Uganda, as a, as a country, we believe that Somalia can be helped to stabilize. Um, it has been a while uh, when the, the country has been without a government, but from the recent developments, from what we see now, from the fact that we've been able to be there for three years and we have uh, been able to, you know, work with the Somalis to this, to this extent, we think that the country can be stabilized with efforts from everybody. You've spoken a lot about the importance of getting the politics right in Somalia. What would you identify as being the principal political problems? I think one of them is, uh, is lack of cohesion within the TFG government and uh, the leadership to understand that Somalia as a country is bigger than individuals. Then. So if they can get that right and uh, uh, each one of them commits himself to helping Somalia to recover other than individually pursuing their interests, then we think it can, it can be all. Now, Ugandan troops have done extraordinarily well given the very small size of the troop numbers relative to the size of Somalia. You have a few thousand where in the south of Afghanistan there are 55,000 troops. Is it frustrating that you've been unable to get the sort of commitment from the African Union that you need to get the job done properly in Somalia? Yeah, to tell the truth, yes. We, we, have some, we feel somehow frustrated that uh, many of our African brothers have not realized that uh, this is a problem which we have to deal with ourselves and that we can help our brothers in Somalia and the continent to get out of this problem. So what happens if we just let Somalia go to rack and ruin or stay in the conditions that it is? Is that a solution, as it were, allowing it to sort of pick itself up over a longer term? Or do you think there are longer consequences for both Africa and the international community? Well, I, I think they may, it, it, uh, it will be destructive. Um, already, right now, the humanitarian situation on the ground calls for intervention. You know, when you look at the, the suffering of the innocent women and children and the elderly, it's, it's really a, a touching situation. So I think uh, the longer it takes for this situation to stabilize, the more lives we are going to lose. And also, uh, going by the what's happening in the other parts of the world, uh, the developments in Afghanistan, where the Taliban are losing ground and where the Al-Qaeda is losing ground. If nothing's done about Somalia, and Somalia remains, um, uh, remains the destination for the displaced Al-Qaeda fighters, then we are going to have a safe haven for these guys, and they're going to, it's going to be very difficult to uproot the, the Al-Qaeda from the continent, given that Somalia uh, has a very long coastline where they can you know, bring in all kinds of weapons. And also given that uh, it has access to the internet, in you can easily access Nairobi, Kenya, and elsewhere. So we really think that uh, as a long term, while we may, people may dismiss Somalia and think Somalia is very far from 
uh, from them, the impacts, the negative impacts of what could develop out of Somalia will soon reach everybody's doorstep. Do you feel as a soldier that you're sometimes plugging the gap of the failure of politicians? Yes, to, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's true. Uh, but as I said before, I think politics should, should really uh, provide the leadership. And if the politics is got right, then the rest will fall in place. The problem is many, so many politicians think that the soldiers should go in and solve, solve the, 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 the issues and then they come later. But I, I believe that uh, we need to get the politics right. And how do you think aid money should be spent bat better in a, a circumstances like Somalia? If you were in charge of all the aid budget to Somalia, what would you put your money into? I think first what we need to do is uh, reconstruct the institutions, the, the, the federal government institutions. That's where the money should go. We, we should be able to put in place uh, you know, the institutions which enable government function. We need to get the police functioning, we need to get the judiciary, we need to get the, the ministries working, because even now, as it is, Somalia has a capability of collecting some revenue from the support from the airport. But because the institution, of, the institution, the financial institution is not working, you can't even realize that little money which is being uh, corrected. So I think that the, the, the money should be towards building the institutions and building capacity for the, for the TFG government. John Abizade is a retired general in the United States Army. He's overseen American military operations in a 27-country region incorporating the Horn of Africa and much of the Middle East, including Iraq. Abizade is the former commander of CENTCOM, United States Central Command, that comprised some 250,000 troops during his tenure. General John Abizad, welcome to the Tswali Dialogue on the Future of Stability Operations. So you're a soldier of enormous uh, experience. Your last command was in U.S. Central Command. You've had uh, peacekeeping experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon. You have spoken very eloquently about the need for a strategic framework in terms of such peacekeeping missions. Could you describe that for us, please? Yeah, Greg, I, I would say that it's so important for 